that's good. Yeah, I certainly am. Okay, hello everybody. I'll just uh, let you read the risk disclosure because I know that's your favorite part of all of these presentations. Um, can I just get a why in the chat just if I can see um, if I can actually see your questions or your chat here? Um, if you could put somebody in, I will presume. There you go. We've got a Herbie Cat. I don't know what Herbie Cat is. Right, so just so you know who this is, uh, this is me. That's not me at my desk. That's me at the desk of a trader in a prop firm in London, uh, one of a number of uh, proprietary trading firms that I actually work with. And they're firms that have a, a slightly different approach to the market to most retail traders, but really with no heavily guarded secrets. Firms that have certainly helped in my own development as a trader. Now, one of the cornerstones of developing as a trader is having an understanding or a philosophy or a belief set in how the markets operate. And today we're going to discuss mine. So today we're going to look at an important but overlooked aspect of the market, something I call market dynamics, or how to conceptualize and understand the massive activity in the market and the resulting moves, how to make sense of it all. And really, we're going to do that for one simple reason, and that is that most traders are stuck and going nowhere. Now, this is a result of a survey I held actually a couple of years ago now, and the results are startling. I've met quite a few traders that have been trying at this for over 20 years. Now, that's a huge amount of time committed with no reward. Now, I wonder how many people in the audience today would be happy if they were still trying to figure this out in 10, 15, 20, or even 25 years. I guess not many. Now, I know that some of you here will probably, there's going to be one or two usually in every webinar that are already in this for 10 years and want to break that cycle. And the problem is for a lot of people, they're not breaking that cycle. And without realizing it, many people are just repeating the same mistakes, which is basically this. In this rush to make money from the markets, few traders really try to understand them. They take a technique, try to make money from it, and then when it doesn't work, they throw it away. Or I'd say when it appears to not work, because at this stage, most of you are at, um, you can't actually tell whether something works or not, strangely enough. Now, on the professional side, they do something very different. They learn about uh, behaviors in the market. They learn about cause and effect, why things happen, and then they figure out how to exploit that behavior. And this presentation, which has helped a lot of traders, is a sort of groundwork to understanding the behavior yourself. And it can be explained in many different ways, and this is my way of explaining it. So what I want you to do, first of all, is take yourself back to that first day when you saw a book or a website or first heard about trading, and you first decided, to look at that giant pool of easy money and make yourself an absolute fortune. So let's say on that day, you met a wise old trader and that wise old trader told you that nobody knows where the market will reverse. Well, if somebody had told you that right from the start, how would that have changed the way you approach the markets? Well, instead of trying to buy the lows and sell the highs, maybe you'd been following moves that had already initiated. If you couldn't tell where a market would reverse, then you'd have to make money some other way. Now, how would we know 
if this statement was actually true or not, right? Well, we'd need to understand how markets behave. And as I said, trading is all about understanding how a market behaves and trying to profit from it. But what does that actually mean, how a market behaves? In fact, what is a market? And we'll answer those questions today. So a big part of trading with confidence is understanding whether a trade makes sense and whether the trade you're in is really working out or not. Many people try to do this with statistics, trying to figure out the amount of time something occurred before in the hope that this will be relevant in the future. And I'm gonna commit heresy here and suggest that in trading, statistics are actually of limited use. And to back that up, I'm gonna ask you a simple question. And think about this. Do you trade statistically yourself? I mean, can your own behavior be modeled statistically? And I'll say for most trades I know, they, all, they trade almost randomly. So will you as a trader trade predictably and according to a rigid mathematical model, even if you just lost a lot of money or you just made a lot of money? or you had an argument with your husband or wife, or you've got a hangover, or you're working on tomorrow's hangover, or you're stressed, or you just won the lottery, or any number of things, and the answer is probably not. Now, I'm not saying there's no place for statistics in trading. I find it very odd that, believe, that people believe the market's gonna to conform to a rigid statistical model, while at the same time knowing that they don't conform to a rigid statistical model themselves. So it's not that statistics are necessarily bad, it's just that there's a more organic side to trading that almost all traders overlook, a side to trading that's just as important as any technical side. So we need to have a model or a philosophy that explains the reason that moves occur in the market in the first place, why people buy and why people sell, but from a human perspective, not a mathematical one. So it's my belief that if you don't have a way to perceive this huge mass of traders, that a purely mathematical approach will leave you at a huge disadvantage. Now, let's just first consider if we're gonna have a world view, how complex does it need to be? Because we know the markets are very complex places. In any market, we're gonna have institutional long-term investors, we're gonna have hedges, swing traders, day traders, HFTs, algorithms, market makers, all participating. Now, one market affects another market, as you know, uh, at a macroeconomical level, like interest rates, currencies, uh, oil prices, uh, we have technically related markets like NASDAQ, Dow, and S&P 500, Brent crude, and WTI. And all of that complexity in relationships is actually quite daunting. Do you actually need to understand it all? Can you trade without knowing what an HFD did in the past 20 nanoseconds? Does your statistical model need to take into account all these variables? Well, before you give yourself a headache over all that, how about we just consider what the result of all that complexity is? Up and down. So despite all the complexity, markets can only go up or down. So you can toss a coin to enter a trade and be right about the markets half the time. Yet a lot of traders don't even have a win rate that's equivalent to random trading. They're not anywhere near that successful. And there's a few reasons that many traders can't get close to random trading results that we'll look at as we go. But bottom line is that the market is very complex, but the outcome is very simple, up or down, that's all. Now, based on the complexity of the market and the number of people involved, you know, you can see how terms like uh, crowd psychology are used to describe the market. And there's two issues with this term, crowd psychology. First of all, there is not one crowd. There's lots of potential crowds with different goals. So market makers, day traders, hedges, spreaders, institution, they all have different goals, different triggers, and make money from different outcomes. But the other much larger problem with this term crowd psychology is that when people mention it, they never tell you how to apply it to make money trading. So it's a clever term that people throw around with absolutely no value. So let's try to give it some value today. And let's first consider something I call the dominant crowd. Because it's my belief that in trading, we have multiple layers of crowds, but only one can be dominant at any time. So the dominant crowd can be considered the one that is influencing market direction the most, but it should not be considered in control of the market. So with the futures markets I trade, I consider three potential dominant crowds. The first, long-term institutions, who most of the time are asleep, or rather, they aren't dominant most of the time. This is a long-term game, so they're not changing their mind and switching positions often. 
So it often takes major economic news for institutional trading to come in and dominate an entire futures market, or like a, a Trump tweet or something like that. Then you get short-term speculators, people like you, people like me, that are in the market to make a short-term dollar. People that aren't really interested in underlying value rising, but trying to make money from movements in the market. And in my markets, this is the dominant crowd most of the time. Then you've got market makers and manipulators who tend not to be dominant unless the market's a bit more quiet, at which point the opportunities for them to make low risk profits increases, you know, uh, nudging the market around a bit. Now, I'll lump in manipulators here because manipulation is really much more likely in a quiet market. Now, if you ever saw your market move one way all day and you tried to keep trading against it or you just couldn't join the move, that's basically you not reacting to a change in the dominant crowd because the moves generated by these crowds are different because of a couple of things. First of all, the time between them buying and selling are different. And second of all, the sort of moves or events that cause them to react are also different. So with HFTs, uh, their holding times are really so short that they also don't tend to be dominant. Their buys and sells are so close to each other that they're basically neutral. So the idea of um, chasing HFTs or tracking HFTs is, is actually quite ludicrous because uh, you, you're talking about in and out in, in milliseconds, microseconds, right? Um, and, their, and their net effect effectively is they tend to slow the market down a little bit, right? Um, they tend to slow, they provide liquidity, they slow the market down, they let us get in and out, but selling algo killing indicators is still a good sales pitch. Now, what would be a reasonable goal when it comes to benefiting from the dominant crowd? I don't mean like percentage return, I mean a goal from any individual trade you're planning to take. So let me give you an example. How about this for a goal? Uh, I want to buy the S&P 500 futures tomorrow. Um, okay, I've got no audio and audio is good. Uh, this is a goal. I want to buy the S&P 500 futures tomorrow with a four tick stop and I want to hold the trade for 12 months. I think we all know that's not going to work, but it's an obvious example, right? Let's consider a less obvious one. How about I want to buy the low of the day on the S&P 500 futures tomorrow and I want to hold till the high of the day. Can that be done? Well, in a way, it doesn't matter because I know for certain I couldn't do it. What's important is whether it fits in with your understanding of how the markets move and how predictable it's possible they could be. So let me explain what's occurring by examining a typical day. And here we have a typical day ahead of us, a day where we have little info other than our levels and scenarios. So a lot of people do homework before the market opens. Um, they set levels before the day starts. Um, doesn't matter here what market this is. These are obviously common levels on the S&P 500, right? So experience tells us there's a number of potential levels above and below that may be significant. Um, common things like yesterday's high and low, that kind of thing. Um, these are the significant ones on S&P 500 futures. So that's what it looks like before your day opens. And then you get the open. And the day opens and you have more potential levels that develop during the day that also might be significant, and the opening price is certainly one of those. But it's only going to be relevant to short-term players. Institutional investors are not going to change their minds if we return to the open on the day, right? We keep these prices on our radar because they are potential crowd reaction points. So we've got the homework-based reaction points created for the open and developing action-based reaction points or potential reaction points. You can use one, you can use both, you can use neither, and you can still make money. And then we get a move. And what we've done now, we've moved through a common level and now we're at another common level. Now in terms of the crowd, as we move up, um, we will see that there are a lot more buy market orders and sell market orders in any move up. And we'll also see large trades mostly on the buy side. So as this move up continues, what is your average retail trader doing? Well, a lot of them are sitting on their hands, watching the market going up, waiting to sell it. And that's despite the fact that the market has upside momentum and despite the fact that order flow and the crowd are clearly favoring the upside. Retail traders want to sell. There's a few good reasons for this. And the one reason is because markets often reverse at levels. There is an assumption that this makes levels a good place to trade. Now, I've never seen that proven. I don't believe it, right? 
I've never seen it proven, but I have seen a lot of people blow up their accounts by trying to buy and sell levels, right? So regardless, we should be able to agree that having a level there doesn't mean the level's the only place you can enter, right? You can use levels for many things and trade entry is just one of them. The other reason people like levels is in theory, levels give you the most profit potential per trade. Let me just turn my cursor on. There you go. Levels give you the most profit potential per trade. In theory, it gets you in at a turning point. So if, if that is, it holds. So if you sell here, obviously you're getting in the best price. Now, if you take a continuation trade after a market's turned, there's obviously less profit potential in that individual trade, but it doesn't mean you'll make more money trading reversals because there are less reversal trades than continuation trades available. Now, reversal trades are also attractive because they've got that very clear get out point. I sell the level, I get out just above. You know, you can just um, put your stop just past this level. It looks much cleaner and it's like, happily comfortable with everybody else's stop as well. But it's really all an optical illusion anyway, because the markets can only go up or down from any price point. And that's true regardless of whether you enter at a potential extreme or you enter in the middle of a move. So what's the smart money doing during this move up? Well, on the way up here, you'll see large trades over and over again, mostly on the buy side. 20s and up on crude, 100 lots of trade and up on S&P. There are lots of people who say the smart money is just the people who bought at the start of a move. And I've heard educators call these start of move prices wholesale prices and that anything after the turn, oh, that's just a retail price. And only stupid traders, bad traders pay retail prices. The pros pay wholesale. And in my opinion, that is absolute nonsense. After all, it, the 100 lot traders you see buying on the way up clearly know what they're doing. And a move up like this would not occur unless there was a significant amount of buying on the way up. So if the smart money only bought the bottom of the move, that would mean only small stupid traders are buying afterwards. And if that was really the case, there wouldn't actually be any move up. And I'll repeat that. If there wasn't serious commitment to the upside, we would not continue to move up. And you can see this yourself. Don't take my word for it. Pull up a tape, have a look at the size of trades during a move and ask yourself, is this all dumb money? It doesn't make any sense. So when momentum is the upside, there are smart short-term traders buying and making the most of the move up. People losing out are the ones who keep selling the move and the ones watching it go up and not participating. Now let's consider how this works from a crowd behavior perspective. We can observe that the smart money just doesn't just buy the extremes of the move. And we've also discussed that having an organic view of the market to complement a technical and fundamental view is a good idea. And you can't really get much more organic than sheep, which as we know, move in herds. So the people that buy at the low of a reversal, a reversal back up, they're the first few sheep to take steps in a new direction from the herd. Other sheep see the move and then move with them. And before you know it, all the sheep are heading in that direction. And it's not a bad thing being a sheep. The moving herds for safety. The sheep that don't follow are the dumb sheep. It's the sheep that don't follow that get eaten by wolves. So if your organic view of the market fits with the sort of crowd or herd behavior we see in sheep, if you think about how and why sheep move, it doesn't seem that smart to always try to be the first sheep to move in a new direction. A lot of times, a few sheep will move out of the herd and none will follow. In fact, uh, if you think about, <coughs> sorry, in fact, we have a few counter trend sheep here at the bottom right of the screen. But, you know, they're, they're basically fading the move, fading the herd. But the chances of them successfully swinging the herd their way at this point is actually extremely low. So these are the counter trend sheep that in a clear move up are trying to sell the market. Now, the sheep analogy for the trading crowd is much closer to the truth than this wholesale retail analogy, which falls apart when you consider the size being traded during a momentum move. It also makes a lot of sense when you watch the order flow too and see how real size is following a move up. Anyway, a day moves on and we get what looks like a turn, oh, could be a pullback, which is it? Is this a few sheep going against the herd or is it a new move initiating? Well, before we answer that, it's worth having a think about why pullbacks occur or why sometimes you might actually need a pullback. So in a move up, we have 
sheep initiating long positions. But these sheep are not buyers. They've already bought. They are now future sellers. So we have a combination of two things occurring. One, more and more of the sheep have already built a long position of a size they're comfortable with and they don't want to buy any more. And two, some of the sheep start to offload and take profits. So you inevitably get a push down. You can't, you can't move in a one-way direction because at the end of the day, people would have bought or you know got to their max position size, right? So you get a push down and after a small amount of selling, one or two things happens, right? We all know this. Um, you could get a small amount of selling, market moves up, and then the sheep quickly re-engage on the long side. So we've managed to shake off a bunch of uh, future sellers or stale longs. People can see the pullback held and sheep see the safety of the herds on the long side. The long trade then is the one that will attract the most sheep. Or of course, the alternative is more and more sheep sell and this will continue until sellers overwhelm any remaining buyers. More and more sheep see this and believe that now the opportunity is to the downside. So the herd has shifted. And as traders, we're watching this play out, just like all those sheep, we're trying to assess the movement of the herd. And that's why a lot of people use order flow to watch that activity and to gauge whether it's a few sheep or all of them. So who are the sheep? It's not me, obviously. <laughs> you know, it's common for traders to think, to see themselves as one thing and see the market as something else, right? Like a good analogy would be, you're a climber, and the market is the mountain, right? What's a little harder to conceptualize is that as traders, we are all simply just other sheep in the herd. So you're a sheep, other traders are sheep, I'm a sheep, the algorithm's a sheep. And of course, there's gonna be little baby sheep and there's gonna be big alpha sheep. So you and the market are exactly the same thing, right? And as traders, at some point, you have to accept that the market is simply made up of lots of people trying to figure out what everybody else is about to do, either short term or long term. And it's the result of that process that creates the move, right? I'm going to say that one more time, right? The only thing that makes moves in the market is people trying to guess what everybody else is doing. That's it. That's what's happening when you trade. It's a bit of a, it kind of twists your brain a little bit, right? Cause, but that's what you're doing, right? Don't, you twist your brain a little bit because how could it possibly be moving just because everybody's trying to guess what everybody else is doing? That's not right. It can't be right. And I say to you, what do you do? Well, I try to guess what everybody else is doing. You know yourself that that's what you're doing. It's just that's what everybody's doing, right? There is no the market. There's just a bunch of people like you, right? And it does twist your brain, right, to think that that's what everybody's doing. Uh, but there is no market. There's just lots of people and machines all trying to take advantage of each other. Once you understand that, get over it, understand it, find a way to profit from it. Okay, that's what we're here to do. Now, as we discussed earlier, it would be crazy for me to suggest I could predict what any of you as individuals at home are going to do tomorrow when you trade. So let's embrace that we don't know where the market will turn and that nobody else does either because it's all sheep and there are simply too many sheep and too many variables. That in itself does not make trading more difficult. It just changes your approach. It changes how you make money from the market. So where do levels come in? Well, a good level is one that's well known. If it's not well known, not many sheep are gonna react there. And even with well-known levels, the sheep might ignore it this time round, but take notice next time round. It is quite random. What we do know is this. When a market reverses off a well-known level, the sheep are more comfortable going with that move. And this is where levels actually help. A move off a level is more likely to continue than a move out of nowhere. It helps with bias. So levels are great. Just trying to initiate trades exactly at your levels and expecting the market to reverse there and giving you a 10 or 20 or 50 tick trade, that's not great. You can still get good trades, but why do you need to trade at these turning points? Why do you need to predict uh, so far in advance where the market's going to turn? Why be the first sheep? What's the upside for being the first sheep? Well, from what I can see, it's more ticks on any individual winning trade, but bigger and more frequent losers. And that's what retail traders are doing. They're trying to predict where the crowd will turn. Professional traders in the main, and I know a lot of professional traders, are simply trading what's happening right now. So when you try and trade a major turn, you are trading against momentum. Market is moving one way, and you're trying to predict a sudden mass change of mind 
across thousands or tens of thousands of people and algorithms and all that. So it's you and the people like you that are turning the market around. So if you're a reversal trader, you're doing all the heavy lifting for the people that jump on board afterwards, for which um, I would like to thank you if you're one of them. Now, at some point, we do need to confirm that any counter trend move is a reversal or not. And if it is, there should be this sheep activity telling us that it is. So on a reversal down, market sellers should outnumber buyers. Volume on a push down will be relatively high because there's more sheep. And the size of the push down will be greater than any pullbacks on the way up to that day. In other words, a decent push down with good participation is exactly what you want to see. This is, of course, if the day time frame speculators are the dominant crowd, right? If you've just had a Trump tweet, if there's just been an interest rate change, it's a different game. It's a different set of traders. So until you see these things happen, until you see the sheep on your side, you have to be very careful trading against the market. You know, you might just be seeing a few wayward sheep. So where levels really help, in my opinion, is where a reversal occurs near a well-known level, it tends to attract more sheep and it helps you confirm that direction has changed. So back to our example. Regardless of whether we got on board or not, the sheep have now taken the market down and we're back to the open. Another potential reversal point, or in my opinion, another point where a place or another place where a bounce could bring in sheep. So let's run through it again. Is this high the only place in this move down where smart money entered? Is this the only wholesale price? And all these prices on the way down, just dumb old retail prices. All right, guys, um, so, back with you. Sorry about that. I had to uh, have a couple of things orders to do. And uh, 20 had to step on ES, away and 20, had to 30 make a... lot of orders on crude on the way down here. Is that just the dumb money? They're just like really, really rich, dumb people. If we enter long now, what's the chance of us getting trampled by sheep? So if you think of the market as a herd of sheep, it makes you think about making money out of the market in a slightly different way. The hard way is being the lead sheep because quite often you'll be out there in front all feeling great about yourself and you look behind and there's nobody behind you. They're all going the other way. So being the lead sheep, I understand it. It's enticing because you get to enter on one of these lovely turns and put your stop right above it. On the other hand, being a follower sheep means entering with momentum and there are simply many, many more momentum opportunities than reversal opportunities. So there's no concept of missed the turn, I've missed the trade if you're playing continuation. Now, when you think of market as a herd of sheep, you are kind of embracing the uncertainty of the market, which is a beautiful thing about the markets. You can have your levels, but you don't need them to hold to the tick. They are simply potential reaction points. When it moves underway, small pullbacks, iceberg orders, high volume nodes, all give you the opportunity to enter as long as the sheep are still on your side. Now sure, these might be new locations to your average candlestick trader, but they're not actually that hard to spot. So I hope this has been um, food for thought for many of you. And this has been an insight into the quality of information you can get from us here at Jigsaw. And I'm gonna give you some more food for thought. Now I mentioned at the start that a lot of the work I do now is with professional firms, which is why Jigsaw are kind of uniquely positioned as a platform provider. Because we work day in, day out with people that trade and the people that teach them and the management of the firms they work with. Now, the original Jigsaw tools were basically just invented to help with my own trading. So we are, as far as I know, the only platform provider that is run by and employs active traders. And what that means is we've come at this from a different angle, a more holistic angle with equal weight on education, execution tools and analytics so that you can do what the prop firms do, which to cut a long story short is to initially learn from somebody but to then learn from your own experience, which is why we have the only automated trade analytics and journaling system that's available, well, anywhere. And I'll tell you something else that no one else does too. Six hours of live trade videos, not me trading, but a proprietary trader in London, and not just any proprietary trader either, but certainly one of the best in the world. And in those videos, you see he's trading, and he talks about what he's doing and why. But it's not just six hours of trading though. It's the key six hours over a number of trading days. So there's no dead spot in the six hours. It's all activity. And this is a trader that can swing $100,000 in a day. Now, over the course of these videos, he makes seven figures on a live account. Not a SIM account, not a demo account, 
real proper money. Now, I'm not sure what that's worth to you, but seeing as nobody else has got anything like this, we could really pretty much name our price, right? But we don't, because we are primarily here to help you and not stiff you. Um, and this is part of our institutional package, and it includes those six hour videos. It includes a price data training course, outlining how these methods are traded. So more than 20 setups plus the market conditions each of those setups is suited to. And these are the actual techniques that prop, use, tra prop traders are using right now. This isn't like 10 year old prop techniques. This is what they're doing right now every day and not just for scalping, but to take bigger bites out of the market. On top of that, we've got another 17 hours of jigsaw education on lots of different topics like scalping, trade management, um, different trade setups, um, lifetime access to our professional grade trading platform, um, one year subscription to the professional version of our trade analytics system and a one year live trade license. And you can get all of that stuff, including the six hour videos, retail price of those components. And no, no, when I say the retail price, I mean what people actually pay, right? The, the sites on our member on our members page, not the inflated price, but those to get those components, uh, it's 2,966 to buy individually, but we're selling it as a bundle at 1899. But just for today, we've created a coupon code called Mr. Top Step. If you go to www.jigsawtrading.com slash institutional and sign up today with that coupon code, Mr. Top Step, M-R-T-O-P-S-T-E-P, -E you can get that bundle for 1799. And that coupon is available for the first 10 people. And uh, with that, that's the end of my spiel. Um, I'll put the link in there. But if you've got any questions, we'd be glad to, uh, to hear them and answer them. Marlin, are you there? I have to do a little dance if you don't have any questions. Okay, I think Marlin, um, I'm not, <laughs> not sure where Marlin is. I think I sent him to sleep. Um, not sure if there's any questions where they'll be. If not, um, I would like to thank you all very much for listening. Uh, wish you the best of luck uh, with your trading. And as you're trading tomorrow, just think about the sheep and whether you really want to be sticking your neck out that far just for the sake of the extra few ticks you get trading reversal. So with that, I will bid you adieu. Thank you.